next segment. So we are running five minutes ahead of schedule. Um, but what we have up next is a ecosystem showcase of some amazing projects uh, that have been funded and supported by the Ave grant style. So what we'll do is we'll kind of call up all these six speakers that are going to talk about who they are, what they do, and how you may be able to get involved. So without further ado, let's bring on our very first talk, and that is Hilmar from Gelato, and Hilmar's going to talk about everything that's happening with Gelato. So I'll ask you to turn your camera on, and uh, we can uh, get started. Hey, Kasek, how's it going? Good, welcome. Let's do it. You guys see me all right? Yes. Uh, yeah, I think uh, there might be an audio issue if you're not able to hear me, but can I can hear you just fine. Yeah. yeah. So it would be great to learn more about Gelato, and uh, you can uh, just take it from here. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, I work at a project called Gelato. Um, Gelato is a protocol that automates smart contract executions on Ethereum and on other networks. And uh, yeah, basically we help developer teams to automate certain aspects of their dApps, um, kind of like taking away the burden of all the DevOps related technicalities that uh, come with running sophisticated financial products um, on public blockchains. And yeah, we, we received an um, Ava Grand style grant um, some time ago to help build out a, a cool product, uh, which is um, uh, available on a website called Kono Finance. And that's basically um, automate, like paying back um, uh, debt positions um, and preventing liquidations by kind of like periodically always uh, selling some of your collateral off um, for um the debt that you borrowed and then paying back your uh, debt periodically to avoid getting liquidated and having to pay liquidation penalties and yeah that's basically what we what we built with the other grand store and i uh, appreciate the support of uh other there a lot amazing um yeah i'll kind of do some q a here as well so um let's kind of go deeper into what Gelato is. Uh, you've obviously been part of uh, the ETH Global side for, as a hack member, it's been for the past few years and you've kind of learned so much about what's happening in this ecosystem. And I think I remember just chatting with you a while ago and uh, you kind of also got into the Ave ecosystem a bit early. So just walk us through how Gelato is set up. What was the need for uh, you to build this thing and sort of just everything's happened the past year and a half. Yeah, so yeah, things develop fairly quickly. Um, I think like, Two to three years ago, I was still going to hackathons um, uh, at ETH Global, hacking on some some funny interest rate swap use cases. We're using ETHLAND uh, back then or, or now Aave. Um, and so, yeah, I was all, always kind of like fascinated and tried to kind of like build more sophisticated financial applications, uh, also like options on, on, on DeFi. Um, and every time you every time applications require something to happen on a conditional basis at some point in the future you kind of require this um, second layer of servers or keepers or bots basically running that actually monitor all the states and then execute certain functions at um at, at, at future times basically and um yeah we we kind of like stumbled across this issue a lot of times during um just hacking on stuff um and yeah, at some point um, we were working on a project together with Gnosis and Berlin and, 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 and yeah, we came across this problem again and then we kind of like decided, okay, that's for us, like for us uh, developers, let's just build like a, a tool that really just like outsources that problem um, and, and try to kind of like fix that for, for every, for all of our future projects that we want to build. And um, yeah, we kind of got stuck on this, on, on solving this issue because it is not that straightforward actually. Um, as it may seem, and um, and so uh, yeah, could That's you dig, kind of Could you dig a little bit deeper into that? Like, what are some of the complications? How do you think about some of these guarantees? And also yeah. maybe give us some examples of uh, what you can do or cannot do with Gelato right now. Yeah. So um, there are like the the very basic problem that you need to solve in such a system is basically um, making sure that transactions get mined in a certain period of time at certain future times, right? It maybe sound quite quite easy, but uh, it's actually like, if you think about the blockchain, you only have a certain 
uh, block limit, right? You have a certain capacity and there are a lot of transactions that want to get in during the same times, maybe if they're like high congestion times and you need to make sure to actually fulfill the duties of your protocol to get your transaction mined in a certain time frame. And um, this is fairly easy if you do like one transaction, but if you do like a thousand transactions in a very short period of time, you need to resubmit transactions, you need to cancel certain transactions, then this becomes very, very complicated. Um, and doing this on one network um, on the Ethereum mainnet might still be okay, but if you then have your application deployed on Phantom, on Polygon, on Arbitrum, on Optimism, you suddenly have to run nodes on all these networks. You have to deal with like RPC issues, um, running full nodes on most of these networks is nearly impossible for like the average development team without like a full-time DevOps team around it. So um, yeah, they are like very infrastructure related problems that you have to solve first of all. Um, and then there's the whole, whole, um, whole issue about, um, okay, then you are kind of like the only one running this bot, right? And if your company kind of like censors or acts maliciously or just kind of like goes down for whatever reason, right? Um, then your whole application, this decentralized application you build is now not uh, functioning as intended, right? So similar to kind of like how the graph um, picked, the, picked the kind of like reading data from the chain problem, uh, we, uh, we picked the writing data to the chain on the conditional basis problem, basically. And um, yeah, we want to provide developers with just this infrastructure piece um, that is uh, decentralized, that is censorship resistant, that kind of like runs also when Gelato, our core team at some point in the future is not there anymore, right? That they kind of like can rely on. And, and uh, this is, uh, it takes a bit of time. We are not there yet, uh, but yeah, one, one step at a time. Oh, this is great. And then uh, I was going to say, I think um, in closing, I guess uh, one obvious thing is that most of the people that are watching this thing and, and participating in ETH Online are developers. So as I think about their hackathon projects, can you give them uh, some sort of uh, uh, thoughts or, or suggestions on how they might be able to use Gelato and, and what are some of the things that they can do? Yeah. Problematic. Yeah, so, so yeah, so um, every time you your application needs to execute certain functions at future times, be it like every 10 minutes or be it when Uniswap prices uh, rise above a certain threshold, right? Um, you would otherwise, like you would normally be required to kind of like spin up your own server and kind of like try to get these transactions mined for PUC that might work, but like in production that, that rarely, rarely does. So um, um, rather than just do that, I, I would just uh, encourage you to go to app.gelato.network. There you can literally just um, uh, input the contract address uh, of the contract you want to automate, then all like the functions appear, and then you can just like select the function that you want to automate, and you can um, write a resolver contract uh, that defines upon which condition you actually want that contract to be executed. You can, for example, say, hey, every hour, or you can say um, when um, the balance of this user uh, is greater than X, right? Um, and then you you just deposit some ETH to pay for the transactions and then, or like some Matic on, on Polygon, for example, and then that's it. And and you don't need to worry about running any infra. Um, it should work right away. Um, and if it doesn't, uh, let us know. Come to our developer chats on Discord and we can help you out. Amazing. Well, hopefully everybody uh, got excited about that because uh, there's a lot of automation and scheduling you can do, and there's so many interesting applications with that in DeFi. So yeah. uh, thank you so much, Omar. And uh, for those who are interested, it uh, looks like Bill's already posted uh, a uh, comment on how you can learn more and how you can uh, find out the documentation for Gelato. So thanks again, and we'll move on to our next uh, demo and showcase. And for that, I'd like to welcome Eric, who's going to talk about Omni Analytics. So Eric, whenever you're ready, um, cool. ready to get started. Awesome. Uh, hi, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me OK. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as I have a couple slides. And so I'll talk about our project. Uh, so basically, for the Ave Grants DAO, um, what we did is we were building what we call like an intuitive and extensible analytics framework for the Ave ecosystem. That was part of our, the work we did. and so. I just wanted to start by kind of talking more generally about Omni Analytics Group. Uh, I'm the chief data scientist at Omni Analytics Group. Um, and basically we're a boutique data science firm and we specialize in machine learning, data analysis, AI, and recently cryptocurrency. We've actually been active in the crypto ecosystem uh, now really for a number of years, but especially in this last year, um, we built tools for the Ethereum Foundation, 
Numerai, Uniswap, Gitcoin, Pool Together, and many more. Um, and we we have a little following on Twitter and, you know, 5,000 plus people. They like to kind of hear about data science, crypto related topics. And, and basically the goal fun underpinning what we do, it's always been about the power of data analytics and data de decision, data driven decision making. Um, and so that includes things like insights from statistical modeling, EDA, exploratory data analysis, dashboarding, app development, and our whole goal with what we did for the Aave Grants DAO is we wanted to bring some of this to Aave and the broader community. And so this was basically our focus and it's still ongoing, but we basically broke it down into a three tiered kind of uh, process. It began with a mainnet Dune dashboard. Uh, we later were sort of contracted into um, doing a Polygon dashboard on Dune and we followed a really similar structure. I'll show you both of them in just a moment. Um, but then we wanted to take it a step further. So basically we love Dune, we love the platform. For those of you, you know, who are familiar with it, it's just such a great way to collect data from the blockchain, display it, and, and look at trends and growth trends over time. Um, so we love Dune, but we were thinking, what can we do to take this analysis to the next level? And by our day jobs, what we usually work in is in R. And for those of you who are familiar with the R language, it's effectively a statistical uh, programming language. It has all kinds of toolkits, packages, libraries that can be used to do some pretty cool analyses. And we thought, um, integrating with the Covalent API, where we can pull Aave data, produce a customized dashboard, and really take this to the next level as far as the flexibility would be what we can do to broaden the appeal of the work we've done. So let's take a look. Um, I'm gonna first show you the two Dune dashboards, then I'm gonna show you the R dashboard and just give you an idea of what we have here. So let me take a look at this. So this actually, let me go first to the mainnet dashboard, then I'll show Polygon. So uh, this is our first Dune dashboard and we structured it in, in such a way that we wanted to present what was the uh, essentially the most important information upfront. And really this is like, you know, illustrating the growth of Aave as a platform upfront. And we sort of broke it down into these categories. So basically usage metrics where you can see like daily active users, new users of the platform, number of transactions on the platform. And then we basically have a whole section where you can see volume metrics. So this is things like deposit volume, flash loan volume, bar borrow volume, liquidation volume. And we sort of have this consistent structure where you can see there's always a counter and that counter is like one day, seven day, 30 day, and then the total volume. Along with it, we have time series. So basically you get an aggregate metric of each and then you get a time series metric where uh, effectively that gives you a view of how the growth has has taken place as a function of time. One of the challenges and things that we just had to overcome is Aave, uh, there's basically V1 and V2 uh, versions of the contracts and we aggregated this so you can see it dates back to June for the V1 and then I think since December for the V2 and these queries unless we're indicated are all at the aggregate level. You can see this dashboard has quite a lot of statistics, but we tried to keep like keep it consistent, clean, and the relevant stats like really prominent. So that's our main net dashboard. Um, the second one, and I won't take too much time on this because you'll notice it's quite similar, and that was uh, by design. We basically rebuilt the dashboard in for Polygon, and so you'll notice most of the same metrics, some of them are still pending, uh, some data has recently been added to those tables that have enabled more and we're still working on some more, but a similar structure, basically all the metrics targeting the Polygon um, chain, so same idea there. Okay. And then finally, I wanna show you our start on the R dashboard. So basically what this is here is uh, a R Shiny. So those of you who are familiar with it, basically Shiny itself uh, is a way of turning an R analysis into an interactive web application. And we basically built a similar concept to the Dune dashboard, but what we've added so far is basically some interactivity for the user. So instead of just a big tall scrolling list of the volume metrics, so you can select which one you're interested in viewing and then immediately get those results. You can also then filter to a specific 
specific date range. So for instance, maybe you're interested in since the beginning of the year to in this case, September 16th to see the aggregate metrics across that time span, then you can get that. And we have plenty more functionality like usage metrics and these all uh, are dynamic plots. We try to include some Aave branding. It's very much a work in progress, but we have a lot of great ideas for what we can do to keep making this uh, more extensible and more sustainable. One other quick comment, just for those of you who are interested, this right here is our GitHub and we're posting the code uh, that basically is used to underpin the dashboard and the Shiny dashboard itself on our GitHub, on the analytics group Aave Growth Dashboard. Anyone's welcome to check it out, follow the instructions to install it and run it locally. And if you have any great ideas for what we could visualize in the dashboard, we're more than happy to hear those ideas. Okay. Let me go back to the slides here and then I'll finish it up. Okay, so in conclusion, really what it comes down to, we're firm believers that when data underpins like the decision making process, organizations run more efficiently. And so we really wanted to build upon the analytics done in the Dune dashboards, but with the R code, we're exposing the analysis to a wider swath of users. We're interfacing with the Covalent API and exposing that growth data in a way that really the whole community and other developers can access and explore themselves. And since this data is so rich, the potential is so vast, we believe there's a lot more that can be done beyond just what we've done, but we're really, really excited to keep working and about the potential of this. And that's all I had. Thank you so much. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Oh, this is amazing, Eric. Thanks for uh, covering this. I think uh, uh, there's a couple of questions. So I think would be good to know is uh, it'd, be, it'd be great to uh, get your take on sort of the comparison between now focusing on doing this thing for DeFi and crypto and, and sort of what you were doing before. Uh, what yeah. was that? Like, what were some of the learnings or rather insights or the things you were talked about? Uh, let's start with that and we can dig in a little bit more. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. So effectively, like when we start, when Omni Analytics Group was started, uh, it, we really were focusing on general statistical consulting. And we were looking at like, what are especially like more underserved areas as far as like, you know, industries that don't typically think about statistical, you know, statistical insights as being something that they need to really worry about. And so what ended up happening is as statistics and data science got a little bit more prevalent and, and people started figuring out that this is an industry that needs to be taken seriously, they need to make data-driven decisions, what, what happened is we sort of found the cryptocurrency community and things were starting to take off, but we were seeing some similar patterns, which is that, you know, it, there's a lot of data out there, but sometimes half the battle is just structuring it in a nice way so that you can start to find those insights. And that transition sort of was that, you know, this is another major community, cryptocurrency and, you know, blockchain was exploding in 2017, but that does, we didn't have all the analytical tools that we do now, and we wanted to really kind of push in that direction. When you say you didn't have the tools, is that just a comment on not having access to the chain data, or do you mean something specific? That, that, that it's, it's uh, yeah, m mostly that. I think just at the time, you know, th that data was available, but now we have it basically in a way like Dune lets us just trivially access it. And that just opens up so much potential. But the Covalent API is another good example where effectively we've gone from, yeah, that data is all there, but now we have one unified API that we can just, you know, write some wrapper R code and pull all that and do some pretty cool analysis with it. No, it's amazing. And then, um, I know you kind of touched on this thing a little bit, but maybe it'd be awesome if you can dive a little bit more into what are some of these uh, insights that you kind of hope to draw from uh, kind of the Aave reports or the dashboards. Uh, a lot of this is, I guess, uh, the way I understood it, a lot of this was just being able to present the same information uh, slightly differently, but it, how do you think about being actionable from, from Yeah, that? great question. So what, I, I actually had a discussion about this yesterday with the team because we're what we were thinking, like we spent a lot of time building up the data infrastructure for this effectively to show the growth of, of Aave as a platform. And I think we were really successful in doing that, but to take it to the next step, kind of, you know, what we're thinking here is there's all kinds of metrics that we're basically showing historical data on that we're visualizing the historical data, but what we're not doing at this stage is actually making forecasts, fitting statistical models. So for instance, you know, these, we're seeing a sustained growth in the number of transactions on the platform 
form, but what could those forecasts look like if we were to project them, you know, end months out into the future? And to, you know, there's plenty of machine learning algorithms that we can do to have a pretty accurate time series forecast. And then it would be really interesting to do stuff like having these forecasts produced and then essentially compared against for accuracy as a function of time. So we can continue seeing and refining the estimates over time. I think that would be one direction that would be uh, really worth exploring. No, for sure. That makes a lot of sense. Um, is this something that requires, I guess, more input from uh, kind of the community or the governance sort of calls or, or like, how do you think about prioritizing which ones to focus on? I, I think I think having some more input would be good because, like you said, it's a question of prioritization. We, we the the sky is sort of the limit for what we can do, but maybe there's an immediate need we want to say, like if, if if you know this these projections are just one example, but if someone was say you know interested to say what is the you know the projected borrow volume over the next n months, and we started with something like that, we kind of could prototype it out, assess how the model is doing, and then expand it as you know the community sees fit. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, exactly. It'll be uh, case by case, I guess, or need based. Um, and lastly, before we move on to our next talk, um, how can people get involved in what you're doing and where can they find out more? Sure. So uh, lots of ways to do that. But um, if you want to get in contact with us directly, uh, our Twitter profile is the probably the best way to do it, twitter.com slash omnianalytics. And if you DM us uh, and, and just you know say you want to get involved with working on this, whatever aspect it is, we would love to collaborate. Um, we, we, like I said, everything that we've done for the R dashboard is on GitHub, and then everything for the Dune dashboards is obviously on Dune public facing. And we'd love anyone, if, if they'd like to collaborate with us, just contact us on Twitter. Uh, my email also, eric at omnianalytics.io. If anyone wants to contact me directly, that works just fine as well. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Eric. and. Uh... Hopefully more data scientists and eager engineers uh, come in and help out with those models. Thank you very much. And with that, we are ready to move on to our next demo and want to welcome Dennison, who's going to talk about Tally. Great to see you again, Dennison. Hello, hello, howdy, howdy. Uh, good to see you too. Good to see everyone here. Um, that was a really great presentation. I was just writing out Eric's email address because I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so what I wanted to talk about today was the project that we worked on for Abe Grants. Um, ours was a pretty interesting project. It's called Tally Safeguard, and it was originally built uh, from a Uniswap grant. So the, the idea of Tally Safeguard was to address some concerns around the flexibility and permissions layer of DAOs. And our grant with Aave was specifically around funding the uh, audit with Open Zeppelin uh, of these contracts. So I think the best way to sort of describe um, the, the tally safeguard, what the problem is, is that uh, you have a couple different camps when it comes to like governance and the ability of like governance to act quickly in the event of an emergency. Uh, it's a little bit timely if some people are following the, the bug in um, uh, compound uh, introduced by a, a community proposal or introduced by a proposal, there's this need to have a permissions layer around acting quickly. So uh, what Tally Safeguard does is actually wraps the time lock, which is the sort of authority in your governance with a permission system where you can give different addresses permissions around creating uh, proposals uh, executing proposals and canceling proposals. The idea here is, is that you can go from a governance structure where you have the token holders who directly control uh, a time lock to uh, a situation where the token holders directly control the time lock, but they can add other folks as controllers on the time lock with different permissions. So for example, they could say, hey, um, we want to add this multi-sig to have the authority to create proposals on this time lock that then sit in the time lock for some duration of time during which governance could come in and cancel them, right? So the idea here is if you have a trusted group of individuals that um, have the ability to like create proposals at, at will, uh, there should be some sort of administrative function where governance can come in and say, no, this proposal should not go through. Uh, similarly, governance can give someone else the ability to cancel proposal. Um, so what you end up having is this, this ability to like compose 
authority in your governance. And the way that would look is a little bit how I just described it. You may have one multi-sig that has the ability to create proposals, uh, another multi-sig or an individual that has the ability to cancel proposals. So you could use that, for example, in a setup where um, you know, governance is, is open and it can create a proposal, but you could have a sort of a overseeing group of security esper experts who have the ability to cancel a proposal, uh, or you could do it the other way around, right? The security experts can propose a proposal, governance can cancel it. Uh, you can also use it without uh, a governance itself, where you could just simply have different combinations of multi-sigs or different combinations of individual ad addresses that have different permissions to, to create, uh, execute, or cancel. So you can kind of imagine how you could build any sort of permission structure based around that so that you can have um, a DAO that both has true token holder governance, but also has the ability to execute things in a quick manner uh, or can be used as sort of like a subgroup for, for um, treasuries. A great example that, that we first uh, had thought about when we were building Safeguard was grants committees, where grants committees themselves have this interesting situation where uh, you know, a proposal is created on governance that says, okay, let's give a million dollars to this grants committee. And now this grants committee is a, a group of multi-sig holders, but now they receive the money and they have ultimate authority over this money, right? It's not possible for the, the governance to claim this money back from the multi-sig unless you ask the multi-sig nicely. And this can sometimes be an issue, right? Like you can, you can uh, distribute funds to a multi-sig that are worth a you know, million dollars on day one, uh, you know, DeFi can go to the moon and they can end up having a hundred million dollars in that multi-sig. So the sort of trust assumptions that the community may make around members or signers of this multi-sig may be different depending on the, the levels of, uh, maybe different like based on like how much value is being held there. But this sort of like delegation of authority in, in terms of delegating uh, money is really one way. So the idea here around safeguard was is that you could use it, for example, in grants committees where you can delegate spending authority to a group but the governance can still take it away without actually having to ask permission from the multi-sig holders to do that. So what I, I'll share here really briefly is just our repo so folks can see it and uh, go check it out. This is what's being audited uh, currently at Open Zeppelin. We have, uh, you can find it here at uh, github.com backslash with tally backslash safeguard. Uh, if you go through the README, I'm not going to go through the README fully, but if you go through the README, you can talk, it talks about the sort of problems that I just laid out and uh, the solution and vision that we have thought of, including sort of a, a preliminary specification on how it works. So this grant was uh, for auditing it. Um, the audit is almost complete. We've just gone through the process of uh, addressing some um, just minor, minor things that came up in the audit. Um, nothing, nothing major, but that audit should be completed in the next couple of weeks. Um, you know, optimistically next week, um, uh, probably safer to say in the next two or three weeks. And that will be available here. Obviously it's open source, anyone can use it. Uh, and happy to really talk to folks who are interested in finding ways to incorporate this with their multi-sig, with their governance of multi-sig, with their, you know, governance, multi-sig, end user, uh, externally owned account. Um, I always call it like end because it's E, uh, externally owned account. So we're happy to speak with anyone about that, happy to talk more about that. Um, you can, uh, you know, uh, uh, go to the, the repo here and you can also always find us at uh, withtally.com, which is here. So uh, happy to take any questions and yeah. That was awesome. Um, thanks for that. Uh, I, I think, uh... It's less of a question, more of like, I want to give you more of a spotlight after the audit is done, specifically, what can people do and what would you like them to do? So after the audit is done, what I would like to see people do is two things. One is I would like to see grants committees set up where the governance has true authority over the grant money, right? Uh, it, it doesn't feel long term, right? When we talk about Ave Grants Committee, Uniswap Grants Committee, Compound Grants Committee, these are very large DAOs with a lot of money, with a lot of prestige. And it's not so hard for them to find pretty high profile individuals who can be trusted uh, folks to, to manage these, these pools of money. 
However, you know, when we talk about the future and DAOs really spreading, not all DAOs are going to always have access to these, these sort of like, quote unquote, famousy individuals with a lot to lose and reputation in the space to manage their pools of money. And they can certainly run into a situation where maybe today, you know, XYZ dog token, you know, maybe it's worth a thousand dollars, but, you know, something happens and boom, now it's worth $10 million. And oh, by the way, it's managed by five anonymous uh, users on a multisig that you've actually never met, right? O of which you're not even sure they're all different people, right? It could all, all be one person. So, so for these smaller communities, the risk becomes quite high and that becomes a kind of existential risk to the trust in the community. So if you use something like Tally Safeguard, um, these grants committees can sort of insulate themselves from that danger. On the flip side, it also potentially, and I'm not a lawyer, I cannot give legal advice, um, but it can potentially help with the claim around decentralization. Right, so you um, currently, so a lot of uh, governances use multi-sigs as their governance, um, but in the eyes of, of uh, some, you know, legal uh, things, again, I'm not a lawyer, um, that might not actually fly, right? Like you, you have the concept of like an unincorporated general partnership, which is what most multi-sigs are. Um, these multi-sigs are, you know, if you create a grants committee with a bunch of friends, um, actually, each of you is responsible for paying tax on the entire sum of money that is uh, uh, received in that multi-sig because it's an unincorporated general partnership. Again, this is not legal advice. Um, so, you know, using something like Tally Safeguard where actually the governance has the uh, ultimate authority. And for example, you know, maybe the multi-sig holders can propose ideas that still go past governance. And if governance does not take action, can be automatically uh, you know, effectuated, um, maybe in some cases uh, supports the argument that you're truly decentralized, right? Because today, um, you know, using just a multi-sig straight really puts a lot of onus on the multi-sig holders and a lot of liability potentially on the multi-sig holders. Again, not a lawyer, not legal advice, uh, but you know, the, the thoughts are like, how do you build a safe protocol um, that's both safe for the members and safe for um, the 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 uh, participants who are maybe signers. So that's where you know I think that's a really great example for your for your governance for your um, you know uh, grants committee. No, it's awesome, and I think I want to also say that as a side effect of this setup, you also uh, get to design a system that scales with the user base. Like now, you can have a lot of people come in instead of having two to three or whatever, five people just kind of making a hierarchy around a like 2000 person DAO. So uh, you also want to think about those because that exactly. prevents from growing even more. Exactly. Uh, amazing. So thank you so much, Denison. And thank for you. check out Safeguard on the Tally GitHub repo. Excellent. Thank you, folks. All right. With that, we are ready to move on to our next talk. And introducing next is Will uh, Robinson from DeFi Lines. And Will's going to talk about what DeFi Alliance is and how they work with uh, Aave and everything that you can do to get involved with DeFi Alliance. So without further ado, let's welcome Will. Hi, everybody. Uh, excuse the background. I'm reporting from stairs as my house is under duress. Um, uh, my name is Will. I've been at DeFi Alliance for six months, a uh, proud recipient of an Aave grant. Uh, DeFi Alliance has been around for over a year and a half, building out uh, an accelerator that helps grow DeFi users to uh, 1 billion by 2025. It's an ambitious mission. Uh, it basically means that we're uh, looking to uh, find new projects, grow them, invest in them, connect them, teach them through a curriculum that runs uh, basically four times a year at this point. Uh, we're finishing up with cohort five. We'll be doing a keynote next week hosted by um, Joey Krug, uh, who is from Pantera and Augur. Um, and there we will showcase uh, 25 teams, uh, two of which were sponsored by Ave Grants uh, to uh, build out protocols um, and grow on top of Ave. So interestingly, uh, early on, we had partners from layer ones like Celo and Terra and Algorand now, um, and Solana, 
Uh, and these ecosystems, right, they wanted us to bring DeFi to them and accelerate on top of them. But at a certain point, we realized that like Aave is its own ecosystem. Um, it's its own platform to grow and build on top of. And this is the promise of DeFi, right? Lego blocks. Uh, and so Aave wanting to um, support projects building on top of its foundational Lego block, like thus increasing its moat uh, and importance in DeFi, uh, you know, tapped us to, to, and we tapped them, I guess, to, to try and do that. Uh, and so only they and uh, Uniswap have been like uh, layer 1.5 uh, for us as partners. Uh, and I'll show you my our website so you can get a sense of what we're all about. Uh, you should be able to see it here. So uh, defialliance.co, uh, helping Web3 startups succeed. Uh, we have uh, basically this theme around terraforming new lands um, and uh, Ave's logo will be scrolling by in a moment there. <laughs> um, so we have uh, two facets. We have the accelerators, uh, which are DeFi and gaming now. Uh, my own background is across both. I used to be a financial auditor uh, looking at crypto wallets and multi-sigs and making sure that the assets were there and that I could sign off on the books. But before that, I did a PhD in video game design. Uh, and so I'm excited to do both. And think very closely about the intersection between DeFi and gaming as well, because we see gaming as like the road to future uh, DeFi users. Uh, and I, I suspect we will be letting in Avagachi, if not in this accelerator, in the next one, as like a very cool example of a game built on Aave. Um, and then we have this industry network. Uh, these are, you know, companies, uh, that are made up of market makers and liquidity providers to help bootstrap our DeFi protocols, uh, but also like lawyers who are really important and code auditors uh, and community managers, you know, the sort of penalty of all things you would want to have to ensure success for your teams. Um, and we've accelerated some pretty cool alumni. Um, and yeah, what makes us unique is our access to liquidity and community and investment. Um, and uh, we have these like amazing mentors, uh, like the list goes on forever. Uh, you could come see at some point who, who you'd like to, to meet maybe one day. Um, and the uh, grant has allowed us to um, essentially bring these teams on without taking equity uh, in, their, in their product. This is allows, allowing us to source better teams um, that just want to grow and don't need to worry about like the financials or anything. And so we give them this sort of like VC privileged accelerator process. Um, and that's like covered by Ave. So in some ways we're like a, a grant regifter in, in that sense. Um, and we have a, a variety of resources. We also manage something called DeFi grants where you can see um, not just Ave's grants but um, everybody's grants in the ecosystem. And we're trying to make this the go-to place to, to find capital. So if you're interested in that, definitely take a look here. Um, we also, in addition to DeFi grants, uh, maintain something called DeFi jobs, which is over here. Um, and we have like 206 jobs in DeFi. This is all a work in progress. This is our old logo. Um, but you can find like, for instance, the nine jobs at Aave or you know, jobs at some of our cohort companies and other companies we've accelerated. Uh, the uh, overall like goal, right, is to foster a really rich community full of like signal, uh, filter a lot of the noise that you find in crypto and make sure that we find strong builders who want to come work together from a diverse set of backgrounds and skills. Uh, and if you're interested in doing that, we'd really love to get your application in. You can apply to DeFi or gaming. Um, if you're building on top of Aave, we'd love to, to hear about you. You can get your questions answered here. Um, you can apply through our form right here. Uh, so, you know, here's the, here's the cohort six application form, which will be starting sometime. We said November 23rd, we'll actually be pushing it um, because uh, we're also, as the DeFi Alliance, about to go DAO. Um, We've been like a centralized organization trying to get this thing off the ground, but we really want to um, sort of dog food the Web3 that we're building um, and think that it's 
totally worthwhile to experience being a Web3 company, accelerating Web3 companies uh, in, in this way. Uh, so deciding to do that has meant this is a 40 day delay on this cohort. Um, I also can like show you our industry network. So because we've succeeded at attracting, um, you know, such great companies because they don't have to give up equity, we have great sort of service opportunities. So like, if you want uh, and join DeFi Alliance, I like you'll jump the line at Quant Steps, Quant Stamps public queue for audits, for instance. Um, or you'll get to like talk to our hype marketing team or directly to Jump Capital or Wintermute to get your liquidity. Um, and so all of this is possible because of our sponsors like Ave Grants. Um, and the hope is just to uh, grow DeFi as fast as possible and be along for the ride. My, uh, my sense of this is that uh, we're, we're kind of summoning like primordial forces when playing with crypto, these sort of like self-perpetuating protocols that through value capture and then ability to redirect incentives, grow a whole new um, way of being and interacting. And I think it's terrifying and also amazing. And that's that's why I'm really keen to, to join this like ride and to see where this goes. And so I think that's the passion that fuels DeFi Alliance is just let's make DeFi happen faster and, uh, and and think about it critically while we do it. I uh, am totally happy to um, take questions if those do uh, happen, but otherwise uh, I can also keep going. Uh, Kartik, do you wanna give me some guidance here? Yeah, uh, so we got a couple minutes. I, I think uh, if you have anything else you wanna uh, talk about, please free, uh, feel free to. Uh, I think the one question um, we would have is, you sort of talked about the experience of the accelerator without the dilution, which is a pretty good incentive and, uh, and a pretty good pitch. But uh, could you go a little bit more into detail of, of like how the accelerator works? Uh, what does it mean to be in a batch? Um, what are the things that you do for each of those companies? And just a little bit more about that experience. Yeah, definitely. So uh, it's something of a moving target as we're always refining and uh, you know we're evolving with the times. Um, currently, the Accelerator lasts six weeks, where we do about mm, six hours of content per week. And that's like listening to Kane Warwick speak about how he built synthetics, or listening to Genny Wintermute about how to negotiate your liquidity deal, or listening to Larry Sukernick on how to structure your DAO, or Spencer Applebaum about how to uh, give away governance tokens in order to bootstrap your liquidity that way. Um, so these are really detailed um, lectures that aren't just like, feel good motivational speeches, but like technically like difficult problems that you don't even know you have to solve um, from the industry experts, which is not like the, you know, Y Combinator who people compare us to, um, right? Where it's just like, here's how you like, you know, beat those guys and raise your spirits. It's more like, this is a complicated space. Here's some subject matter experts. Um, and then we have uh, like our ecosystem partners, such as uh, Ave and Uniswap and Solana and Celo and everybody sort of helping out in Polygon and uh, teaching our teams how to build on their systems. We think the future is multi-chain, like, although we love Ethereum, like super deeply, uh, we do want to see all these other platforms give it a shot and grow, um, maybe, you know, teach Ethereum a thing or two and vice versa. Uh, and so uh, they're helping our teams navigate their own grants and their own code reviews. And they're also giving their state of the union and their vision of how they're different. So that's a pretty cool kind of value add. And then we have our regional chapters. Uh, so there's a European DeFi Alliance chapter where we get like a chat from Ajit Tripathi from Ave and Melton Demirers from CoinShares. And that's always a hoot. Uh, and then we give uh, a talk from uh, China with uh, our, our chapter there. Um, that's usually headed up by Mabel Jang, who's from Multicoin. And we have our Indian chapter. Uh, where we'll have like, you know, the Polygon people and other like Quantstamp people uh, and the other amazing companies coming out of India, uh, give the lay of the land, how to hire there, how to market there, how to like um, think about your community um, globally through the lens of these regional chapters. Uh, so that's like a big part of it, but it all sort of like culminates with demo day. And a big part of our program is making sure you can like pitch your company to a large audience of DeFi stakeholders uh, who are gonna know what you're talking about and need you to succinctly 
clarify what you're doing and who you are and why they should trust you. Uh, something that people like often forget is that like DeFi protocols, so until they're like living on their own, are people, right? And like they're going to pivot and they're going to change and they're going to make code mistakes. And you got to really know who the people are behind that protocol until it's like, you know, past its like Lindy effect stage. Uh, so yeah, that's that's our program. Um, you get to chat with me and I get to help you out whenever you need it. Uh, that's another part of it. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the game track, well, we're trying to get like the best game tokenomics people and the Twitch people and the Discord people to sort of structure your community. So if DeFi Alliance, DeFi program is about liquidity, um, the uh, game program that we're launching is about community. Those are the sort of bloods that run through the veins of these different kinds of Web3 projects. And that's a excellent pitch that uh, if I ask anything more, I'll probably ruin the, the good note that it's ended on. So this is great. Everybody who wants to learn uh, more about DeFi Lines, head over to DeFiLines.co and I'm sure you can contact Will on Twitter as well as uh, through the website. So I guess I encourage everybody to apply and uh, with that, we are ready to move on to our next talk. Thanks so much, Will. Bye-bye, everybody. So next up, I want to introduce Matthew, who's going to talk about Rama. So uh, Matthew is here. Uh, whenever you're ready, feel free to uh, get started. And I think you are still uh, muted, so we'll just give it a quick second on uh, being ready on the audio side. Can you guys hear me now? There we go. Yep. Cool. Let's see. And can you see the screen okay? Everything is good. I'll just my full screen here. I don't know. Awesome. All right. So, hello, everyone. My name is Matthew. I'm uh, from, from the Llama community. The Llama community received a grant some time ago from, from Arve, and it's focusing around uh, Arve's treasury management. So, And some difficulties. All right. So within this grant, we have uh, a few main deliverables. The main ones are focusing around the vision for Aave, what we would like to try and achieve with their treasury, how we want to put it to use, and the direction we think we can we can take it in as a community. Uh, we're also putting together. Um, an asset management framework, which kind of really structures a lot of the decisions, allocations, how we're going to implement it, how we kind of approach risk. Uh, we're also going to put in some initial, initial strategies. So I put forward some ideas, they'll pre present it on the governance forum, and then they'll progress to an arc over time. And then hopefully we'll get uh, one of those through within this grant or maybe potentially the next grant. So, and then touching on some of the areas around like financial reporting, uh, what we're looking to create is income statements, uh, cash flow statements, and balance sheets. And we want to start producing those periodically on a monthly basis. And with that, what we're going to try and try and do, different from more traditional companies, is we want to try and make this kind of live data, and we're trying to use data analytics and, and June to help us do that as a tool. So, summarising the the first main deliverable, which is the the vision document. Uh, this is available on the Arve Treasury, um, Arve Governance Forum, if anyone wants to go have a read. So this document is, this outlines the vision. The vision we're presenting to the community is to encourage innovation, accelerate growth, uh, prudent financial management of assets while providing relevant and transparent financial reporting content. Uh, we suggest that the community should remain overweight Arve to capture the future growth upside whilst also hedging the, the risk against adverse market conditions. Uh, assets are to be, to, to be deployed productively within the guidance of best ad, asset management practices. Uh, Real-time financial metrics performance tracking will be providing transparency to the community and support decisions around how best to deploy the community's capital. And we're also the, the treasury management and financial reporting it is in its early days and requires nuanced thinking within crypto. And this creates an opportunity for our way to continue being a leader within the space. So within, within the vision, we're also looking at uh, 
what, how would you construct like a portfolio though of assets that Aave would hold within its treasury? So within that, we're also looking at uh, a lot of risks, which are gonna be heavily detailed in kind of like the asset management guidelines we'll go into a little bit later. Uh, we're looking to some of the unique features around like liquidity considerations at a asset portfolio level, but then also in DeFi specific like on-chain liquidity. So getting in and out of positions. Uh, we're also looking at um, how do you remain long Aave in your treasury and then also deploy it productively. And some of the ways of doing that is, is through debt uh, and whilst maintaining that really large long Aave positioning, we're trying to want to hedge away some of the market volatility. So if we go into say like a crypto winter, the, the treasury doesn't you know, substantially fall with the market. So we're looking to try and offset some of that whilst also capturing that upside. So that's really about like maximizing the upside and then minimizing the downside and really just trying to um, deploy assets when the treasury is productively so we can make the most out of DeFi really. Um, so when we talk into asset management, uh, we're kind of really here, we're trying to really create a framework that the community can kind of understand uh, and refer back to in times like turbulence, like we're really trying to drive this preserved capital whilst growing the protocol, whilst also trying to like reduce risk. Uh, so that's just touching on that, that hedging angle from the price, but then idiosyncratic risk is also where are you deploying your assets? If you deploy all your assets in a single area and something happens to it, then you've got a lot of exposure, but if you spread it out across the space, then you've got less specific risk on each investment. So with this, like the, the risk angle is very important. Um, there is, there's the credit risk, the market risk, there's liquidity, there's infrastructure. So I've kind of touched on those few, few times now. And then the nuance of DeFi is the DeFi specific risks. And that's where you're really starting to think about like smart contract risk, admin keys, oracles, um, open source code. Uh, so basically making sure where you're recommending to suggest to the community that you've done the due diligence and this is a safe rec safe suggestion. So the way in which we tend to implement uh, treasury management is through the AIP process. That means everything's going to go through the governance forum. It's going to be open to community feedback and engagement. We really, really encourage people to, to review our posts and like give constructive feedback. Um, we're all just trying to do the best, best we can. So anyone who comes up with a, like an amazing idea, we really want to hear about it. Um, Within the asset management guidelines, we're also trying to think about long-term for Aave, if there's any strategic assets that have a place in there. So uh, that could be just equity through alignment of two communities kind of objectives. Um, and that could be like just through partnerships as well. If we introduce leverage into the treasury, we really need to have a strong understanding around that, like really know where our health factor is, like our interest cover ratios, what are we gonna do in certain conditions, like a lot of forward planning there. Um, if you think of the, the treasuries like this asset allocation or you know, asset portfolio, periodically, you're probably looking to like rebalance that and within each allocation in that portfolio, you've probably got bands of like mins and maxes where you want to keep a certain allocation. So that's something that we expect to be uh, ongoing over time, there's the potential there to do a, a treasury committee and the, the suggestion we presented is that that would be something that would meet accordingly to review the, the asset management guidelines, um, the existing composition and, you know, how it all kind of fits together with the overall objectives we're trying to achieve. So, and we look to manage the treasury in, uh, in perpetuity. So we're recognizing that like the community has been around a fair while now and it's going to be around for many many years to come and we want to make sure that we're planning for that extended time horizon so the best way for us to frame that is to consider this in in perpetuity so now th this slide trying to show is some of the some of the work we've already done there's a, um, a june analytics page that's out it was done by one of the llama community members 
So what this is showing right now is at the top left, you've got like the Ethereum reserve factor, which is essentially, or are they V2, V1, how much revenue or has been generated from it. So as you can see here, we're looking at like 15.5 million, which is really good. Uh, we've got like reserve factor, sorry, the ecosystem reserve, which is basically the core AVA holding. So, and on the right, we've got like the, the Polygon reserve factor, which is how much revenue has been generated on the Polygon network. And you can see um, from, the, from the charts, like particularly the one on the left, it looks a little bit exponential, like it's a really great chart. Uh, and, you know, Polygon's done really well. It's like coming out of the blocks and it's been super strong performer for the Aave community. So there's a lot more charts on this Aave um, and Llama dashboard. So if everyone is keen to have a look at some of those financial metrics, we encourage you to go, go have a look. So coming into some of the more um, financial kind of reporting side of the, the grant, what we've got here is and this is one of the first statements we've produced, which is basically a USD nominated um, Aave V12 like PL statement. So what it's doing is it's showing monthly the USD value that Aave is kind of um, is is revenue it's generating USD value. Now you know from the previous chart that when you accumulate it, it looks pretty exponential. What you, what you can see here is if you look across the bottom line, as you can see, Aave is actually quite performing quite strongly month on month. It's getting uh, this good growth. You can think back and uh, there's been a fair bit of volatility in the, in the price of assets. What you can see in here is the bottom line in Aave is somewhat influenced, but potentially not as much as what you'd see in some other protocols. So what you're seeing is a really strong upwards trend in this and it's, uh, it's, it's quite a good balance sheet. So this is one of the three main uh, financial deliverables that we've got. And these, these are all available through the Aave governance forum as well. And if we were to look at the, the breakdown of some of this, what we're seeing is the reserve factor is it's very heavily concentrated in um, USDC um, and DAI and USDT, which makes a lot of sense because those are the, the biggest pools on, on Aave for lending and borrowing. And the, the Polygon network is generating very similar, but just in a smaller magnitude, but the distribution is a lot more balanced than say, say V1, V2 combined. So that's really how, what all the numbers are kind of presenting. And if we were to, to look forward to kind of what comes next, uh, we're looking to build out the balance sheet. That's the one piece that we haven't really yet developed. We've got the income statement, we've got the cash flow statement. We really want the balance sheet. And then we're really going to start going into uh, a lot more data on June. We're going to start looking at a lot more financial metrics, like how's Aave performing, um, peer to peer ratio or peer to peer comparisons. So return on investment, all those kinds of statistics is where we're looking to kind of develop out. And we're looking to provide all this in a, a really easy uh, format that the community can kind of take a glance at and really just kind of understand. So, and that's that's how our llamas today, what we've done with our, uh, Aave and a little bit about where we're planning on taking it into the future. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Matthew. And uh... This is great. Um, maybe just one question would be, how can people get involved if they want to and uh, sort of uh, what are some ways to keep up with everything that's happening with Llama? Sure, so the best way to keep up with what Llama's doing with Aave is, is via the, the governance forum, like everything we do there is published. Uh, if someone wanted to get a little bit more actively in, involved in the treasury management side for Aave in particular, uh, I'd definitely be on the, on the governance forum trying to contribute and throw ideas around. That's really a good place to, to showcase what you've got to offer. Uh, in terms of contributing to, to Llama itself, like I think probably just reach out to us via Twitter. So we're not really, don't really have a website with uh, a Discord where you can come join yet. That's something that'll come in time, but yeah, just reach out to us over Twitter and we'd, uh, we'd love to have a chat. Well, thank you so much for that, Matthew. And uh, we are, with that, ready to move on to our next uh, talk and demo. So um, I'd like to welcome Ben uh, from Rabbit Hole.
and uh, we'll just give Ben a quick second to uh, get set up. And uh, Ben, whenever you're ready, feel free to get started. Hey everyone, thanks for thanks for having me today. Um, my name is Ben, and I am the operations lead at Rabbit Hole. For those that don't know, Rabbit Hole is a, a platform that simultaneously does two things. One for communities and protocols like Aave, we help protocols find the best users and participants um, for their network. And then on the other side for, for users, we, we help them learn about onboard into different projects um, and, and use different crypto applications um, and help them earn crypto for doing so. So we recently did a, a quest, the, the core function of rabbit hole is, is a quest where um, a protocol uh, provides some amount of rewards that incentivizes a specific action for users to complete. If rabbit hole, we, we verify using um, the graph uh, that a user has completed a specific action um, that applies to the quest, we reward them with the tokens that are provided. So we recently did a quest through the Aave Grants program where we incentivized users to both uh, lend and borrow funds on Aave Polygon. Um, we targeted 2,000 users and actually had 2,000 users complete this quest and redeem the rewards within 12 hours, um, I believe were the numbers, which was incredible. It really showed um, the excitement within our community and within our users um, for using and getting more acclimated with Aave. If we take a step back, um, rabbit holes is really appealing to the users who are trying to get more involved in crypto and in Web3 um, and to become better better and more knowledgeable citizens of, of the, the Web3 world. And so um, partnering with Rabbit Hole and doing quests on Rabbit Hole is a great way to gain exposure, to educate people, um, and to bring in more uh, eager participants and, and owners of the network. So we're extremely happy with, with the way this most recent quest um, with Ave went. We've are working with a number of other leading uh, program uh, protocols and communities in the Web3 space. We've worked with Uniswap. We just did a quest this past week um, with Polygon. We're working on stuff with, we've worked on stuff with the graph, pool together, um, all different types of protocols in DeFi, NFTs, layer ones, um, really focused on how to get users more educated and more involved uh, in the leading projects in crypto. And then for the leading projects in crypto like Aave, um, how do we find more users who actually want to use the product? We're not about speculation. Um, we're, we're about finding people who are into using projects, want to be good stewards for your community, want to be active users. Um, and I think moving forward, we'd like to move further and further on um, we have the, as a grand vision, um, we, we look at ourselves right now as pioneering learn to earn. So I'm sure most people are familiar with Axie Infinity uh, and, and play to earn. Um, you know, you, you earn money for playing in a game. We look at rabbit hole right now as pioneering learn to earn. Um, so you, you earn uh, a protocol's tokens for learning about them and, and most importantly, actually using them. But moving forward, I think what we'd like to get to is participate to earn. And what participate to earn means is moving more and more into rewarding contributions to networks. And so what that might look like moving forward, and we're working on these capabilities and we'd love to continue discussing them with Aave um, and, and through the grants program, but what participate to earn looks like more and more is like, how do we actually reward value that's contributed to the network? And so um, what, what that might be is you get rewarded if you've, um, uh, if you've lent a certain amount of money and, and driven a certain amount of yield um, over the over six months period of time. And what that's doing is it's incentivizing real sustained contributions, real value provided to the network. And rabbit hole can be the place 
where you incentivize and reward those um, reward those things. Rabbit Hole has, as I mentioned, an extremely eager set of users who love to participate in Web3, um, who are constantly learning and upscaling uh, and can be a really good partner for Aave as Aave thinks about new things that they'd like to incentivize and reward, whether that's launching on a new protocol like we recently did with Aave and Polygon um, or, or whatever that might be. Um, Rabbit Hole can be the place where protocols go uh, to find new participants, incentivize them, make sure that they're the right participants. We offer the ability to filter based on different skills. We offer civil protection. So you know that your every user you get is actually a unique human and um, can be a strong partner in helping Aave strengthen their community moving forward. Um, as I mentioned, had a we're really pleased with the excitement from our rabbit hole community about the Aave quest we did a few weeks ago and look forward to, to more and more, hopefully successful ventures down the line. Awesome. Thank you so much for that awesome intro, Ben. And uh, just so uh, people know how to get in touch with you, what is the best way to uh, learn more? Yeah, if you'd like to reach out to me personally at Ben Schechter on Twitter, um, but for Rabbit Hole, uh, you can go to rabbithole.gg uh, and complete our quest, uh, credential yourself through our skills. If you've uh, done different actions on chain, um, we provide credentials for that, which can then be used to unlock new opportunities, unlock new quests in the future, and to dive further into uh, being a, a Web3 user and citizen. Amazing. Thank you so much, Penn. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me.